All right. Well, I think we'll get started. Um, well, just just tell me when, Megan. Yeah, I would like to turn it over to Barbara Lane, our fearless and wonderful Holly <laughs> Board President. Thank you, Megan. Um, I am Barbara Lane, the president of the OLLI board, and I want to extend a warm welcome to each of you on this very cold March day. The weather just never behaves for our spring open house. At least we're doing this indoors and we don't have to travel. I also want to extend an especially warm welcome to each of you who are new OLLI members or who may be attending today contemplating joining us. Um, if you love learning with others who share your passion, you have definitely come to the right place and we're absolutely delighted to have you with us today. Um, I know that you'll realize as you listen to our amazing lecturers that we have some very, very exciting things in store. Um, one other point I wanna make, we only have three staff members. Like, um, so like all Ollie's throughout the country, we're very much volunteer fueled. Um, whether you're new to the Ollie community or you're a longstanding member who has so far not done any volunteering, please consider volunteering for Ollie in some capacity. We really, really need you to teach a course or maybe two courses. Um, to become a staff writer for our newsletter, um, to initiate a shared interest group. Um, whatever, whatever interest you have, we have a volunteer opportunity for you. Um, volunteering is also a great way to get to know your fellow OLLI members and to begin making the social connections that are so much a part of creating this wonderful OLLI community, which currently has what, I think over 1400 members. I think we're up to 1450 the last time I checked. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, our wonderful volunteer coordinator, Shelly Sturman, who is herself a volunteer for OLLI, would be delighted to speak to you and find just the right place for you here in OLLI. So just reach out to the OLLI office. They'll get you in contact with Shelly. She'll meet with you and you're just gonna be on your way. Um, I think that's it. I wanna turn it over to Megan because we're all here to hear our instructors. So Megan, take it away. Thank you so much. So today we're gonna to meet many of our um, OLLI instructors. Uh, who will be teaching in our spring semester. And um, our spring semester begins, um, uh, sorry, March 18th, just a little bit of technical difficulties there. Um, and this semester, the spring semester, we're going back to having a mix of in-person and online classes. And in fact, two of our classes will be hybrid and you can attend them either online or in person, um, your choice. You can actually go back and forth if you want. And of course the in-person um, sessions will be held here in the Berkshires. Uh, so for the first class, I wanna introduce uh, one of the, I would have to say one of the most popular OLLI instructors, but all of our instructors have uh, a great deal of, um, appreciation and fans from our membership. Catherine Kidd joined us several years ago. She's a retired professor of international relations, but she has wide and deep knowledge um, and curiosity about a variety of subjects. So she's taught classes about contemporary Russia, about immigration, about women in politics, about Congress during uh, the Civil War, and, and more that I can't even remember because they're, they're so diverse. Um, and she has a really exciting class coming up for spring. It has a very long name. It's called Breaking the Common Pot, Dispossession of Land, Community and Culture. It's Mondays beginning March 21st at 2.30 p.m. And it's part of a really uh, quite amazing Ollie, um, initiative called We Are Still Here, Indigenous People of the Northeast, uh, that will culminate in the fall of this year. So Kate will tell us more about the course as well as the new initiative. Kate? Okay, uh, thank you, Megan. Um, 
and I'm really looking forward to teaching this class. Um, you might wonder about the title, Breaking the Common Pot, but um, the image of the common pot, the shared place that food came from, uh, is central to the idea of use of the land of Native Americans all across the US, but especially in the Northeast. Uh, and in this class, we're going to be talking about um, different concepts of land. So European settler cultures think about land as ownership, status, resource exploitation. That's not the way Native Americans have thought about land. They think about land as stewardship. They think about land as relating to other animate beings on the land. So for example, there are Native Americans here in Massachusetts who think that they were born from ash trees. So um, if you think you're born from an ash tree, you would have a very different relationship to the forest than those of us who think of ash trees as something to cut down and make into baseball bats. Um, so stewardship of the land, um, the uh, responsibility for uh, producing products from the land that would feed, that would go into the common pot to support the entire community, and also uh, the link to um, their ancestors who were buried on the land. And that was very, very important for them. But almost as soon as um, European uh, colonial settlers arrived, uh, they began dispossessing Native Americans of the land. Um, so we've got um, about 400 years of history of dispossession. But the way in which Native Americans were dispossessed of land changed uh, over time. Uh, it changed by location um, and, um, and the tools by which uh, dispossession happened also changed. And um, one of the most important uh, individuals uh, who facilitated dispossession was from here in the Berkshires. And that was Henry Dawes. He was a member of the um, Massachusetts legislature. He was um, represented the Berkshires in Congress and then represented Massachusetts in the Senate. He thought he was doing the right thing for Native Americans, but it resulted in the loss of literally millions of acres of land. Um, and there were many myths about Native Americans and land and dispossession. Among them, the idea that Native Americans were going to disappear, which obviously they haven't. They're a growing segment of our population. Um, but um, Native Americans have actively resisted dispossession uh, from the word go. And so a big part of what we'll be talking about in the class is the way in which Native Americans resisted dispossession. Now you might be thinking, well, of course, war, something to think about this week, uh, but they also did it through negotiation of treaties, through petitions to the president, through petitions to Congress, through thousands of lawsuits. And um, now, uh, in contemporary times with repossession of ancestral lands in many parts of the United States. Uh, so in this class, we're going to be exploring all of those issues. Uh, and um, it's definitely something I didn't learn about <laughs> in either school, college or graduate school, but um, so much to learn. And I'm really excited to be teaching this course. As Megan mentioned, um, the course is part of a year-long project that the Ali University Days Committee has been working on. Uh, Michael Wilcox Cox taught a course last semester. In the uh, summer one session, we'll be having a course on indigenous ecology. Um, and 
Uh, then in the fall, we'll be doing a series of um, opportunities to interact with Native American chefs, with Native American musicians, with local historic sites that have links to Native American communities. And we'll be having lectures uh, by important scholars and activists in the Native American community uh, in September. So we're looking forward to sharing all of that with you. And um, if you wanna volunteer, there will be many opportunities. So uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to, uh, for the first time in more than two years to meeting some of you face-to-face -face in the classroom. Um, since the class will be a uh, hybrid. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. And uh, Kate's class, uh, the in-person portion will be held at Berkshire Community College in Pittsfield um, in a, a terrific lecture hall there. Uh, so uh, you can register for her class online or by phone. Uh, if you're not yet an OLLI member, you do need to become a member in order to sign up. Um, and next, I'd like to introduce um, Ben Sosny. He is the executive director of the Berkshire Innovation Center, and he is on our tech, oh gosh, wait, Tech Impact Collaborative, it's changed names several times, um, committee, along with actually Kate, um, Catherine Kidd as well. And this uh, group of OLLI members have partnered with One Berkshire and the Berkshire Innovation Center to really explore and introduce um, new technologies to the Berkshires and explore the impact they might have both locally and you know, nationally and internationally. And we're so fortunate uh, to have Ben here today. He is the executive director, as I said, of the Berkshire Innovation Center, which opened I think right around about the same day as the <laughs> pandemic started. Um, uh, but it's an incredible place and I hope he'll say a little bit about that. Um, he is a lawyer among other things and previously worked for um, Thomas Krenz in North Adams with his uh, you know, extraordinary projects that he's um, planning. Um, and so uh, the committee has put together a really wonderful class that explores innovation, um, in the Berkshires, and he's going to tell you more about that. Ben? Uh, thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. And, and thanks, Catherine. Yeah, as Megan said, um, I had the fortune to meet Kate Kidd and the crew at Ollie on my second day, I think, <laughs> as a director of the Innovation Center when I was definitely drinking from a fire hose, but we have been um, working on programming ever since and it's been a, it's been just such a rewarding experience. So I really thank the OLLI team um, for the opportunity. Um, one of our first projects was to, uh, pre-pandemic, to host a large innovation um, and tech, I guess it was a technology and innovation summit in the Berkshires that we had planned live and in person in different hubs, uh, the BIC and, and, and Northern County and Southern Berkshire County. And um, we were, uh, you know, all set to do that. And then the world had some different ideas about um, a global pandemic happening. So uh, we, we shifted to a, um, a, a series of virtual courses, um, I guess, uh, in the fall of 2020, um, and have had a, a variety of different topics covered, uh, um, you know, on, on, on all kinds of technologies and clean energy and life sciences. Um, but we wanted to take a look this time at doing sort of a general overview of a history of tech and innovation in the Berkshires. It's something that I, um, frankly was not uh, versed in when I took the job. And that's something that has just blown me away. Uh, the, you know, we all know the Berkshires about the, uh, our great cultural assets and, and, and our outdoor recreation. Um, but even as, a, a, you know, growing up here, I, I really wasn't, um, you know, sort of versed in our history. Um, and we work with a lot of uh, young students who aren't aware of both 
the history of innovation, but also what's going on currently. And that's something that we really work to spread the word on. Um, so this class we're very excited about. It's a six session course. It'll be live from the BIC and offered hybrid as well. Um, I see a chat uh, in a question, will there be a tour of the Innovation Center? Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. We'd love to do that and show people around. Um, as Megan said, we did open the Innovation Center on, um, it's actually just, we just had our two year anniversary. So we opened February 28th, 2020. Um, which uh, I think March 7th was the date that Berkshire Health Systems had the first confirmed COVID case. Um, but I am still shocked uh, that we were, that our, that our grand opening did not end up as a super spreader event. I was convinced <laughs> that it was going to be, um, but it was not. Um, so uh, it's a six session course. It starts um, March 23rd, uh, the first course will be really focusing on the history of tech and innovation in the Berkshires. Um, we have a great presentation by um, Evan Hickok um, from General Dynamics, who's also on the Berkshire Museum Board. Um, I've seen him do a version of this presentation to students. Um, it's really fabulous, and he keeps exploring the history of what's happened here, both, uh, you know, on the GE and the G GD side, but also um, through you know, paper and plastics and, and, and all the industries that the Berkshires have, have played such a role in. Um, the next four classes will focus on um, different clusters that, that are so important to our, both the economy of the Commonwealth um, and also locally. Um, the first one um, will be on uh, clean tech and uh, we'll sort of take a view of uh, current state policies, what's going on, and then really dive into some of the local companies that are, are, are operating in this space. Um, the second one will be on um, uh, the um, creative economy and, uh, you know, obviously here in the Berkshires, um, what some of our creatives, uh, how they're integrating technology in the work that they do, both historically and currently. The third will be on the life science sector. Uh, we all know Massachusetts has such a, 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 is such a global leader in the life science space. Um, we'll be joined by uh, someone from Mass Life Science Center and then some of our local firms um, who are operating in this space. And um, the final of this group will be on um, aerospace and defense firms, which is a, a major employer in the region. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, wrap it up with a, with a final class that'll sort of summarize what's going on and, and look at what's next. Um, so really excited and, and grateful for, for uh, to, to uh, Kate, Kid and the team for helping us sort of always drive this along and, 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 and organize something that I think hopefully people will really enjoy. And as Kate said, very, very excited to have people in the building and live as much <laughs> as we love the, and appreciate the technology of Zoom. Um, we are really excited to open our doors and get people in the building. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. And um, so each week it's going to be a panel of different speakers, speakers from the local companies in the Berkshires um, and nearby who will be talking about the really that's, cool stuff they're doing. That's right. Now. Yeah, I, I felt a little awkward being listed as an instructor up here. I'm more of a coordinator and I hopefully people won't be hearing too much from me during this. Um, well, and then the final class will be on the future, right? And looking right, at so I'll be, I'll be on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's highly recommended. Of course, I have I recommend everything that all of our classes because they're so great. Um, so thank you, Ben. And next up, I'd like to introduce Mary Rogers. Mary is another fabulous Ollie instructor. This is the first, the fifth class she's taught for us. Um, she has a master's in English as well as in medieval studies. She's uh, taught um, high school and college. Um, and um, studied Arthurian literature, and um, she is absolutely delightful. Her new class is on restoration comedy. It's online on Wednesdays at 11 a.m., and it's one of our, our limited registration classes, so you want to rush over and sign up for this one. Mary? Thank you, Megan. I appreciate your kind words. Um, this will be the second class that I've taught on Zoom, and I'm still trying to get up to speed with the technology, but uh, it's also something I have to get up to speed with because most of my courses, all of the courses I've taught for Ali so far have been medieval courses. So I'm moving rapidly 
several <laughs> hundred years ahead into the sixth, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, some of you may want to know what restoration in restoration comedy means. Basically, restoration was the term that was given to the period when Charles II, whose father had been uh, beheaded by uh, the Puritans under uh, Cromwell in 1642, uh, he fled and took shelter at the court of France. And when he returned to take possession of the throne again, it was the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. And when he came back, he brought with him the taste for the kind of theatrical uh, performances that he had been used to seeing in France. Um, they were quite different in a number of ways. The, the actual physical space of the theater was different. The use of women as actors rather than boys dressed up as women taking female ro uh, roles um, was something that was all over the continent. And uh, I mean, women were on the stage on the continent for a long time, but when Charles II came back, the female roles were played by women. So that's another interesting change. Uh, what the course is going to attempt to do is six sessions. And um, the first session I'll devote to contextualizing um, and kind of explaining and answering questions about the things that were different in the theater during this period. Uh, the next five, will each focus on a different play. Now I'm calling it restoration comedies. Actually, we're going into the 18th century as well because there was a kind of a second, just as you know, with the romantics, you had Wordsworth and Coleridge as the first generation romantics. And then you had what my uh, irre irreverent friends used to call Byron Sheets and Kelly as the second wave of the romantics. The uh, 18th century playwrights took up pretty much where the restoration um, playwrights left off. So we'll begin with uh, William Witcherly's The Country Wife, a very bawdy text about a man who pretends to be a eunuch so that he can have safe access to jealous husband's wives. And then we'll move on to uh, William Congreve's very sophisticated and a witty way of the world. Uh, which is thoroughly delightful. Uh, we will then do a comedy by Afra Ben. There were actually women playwrights writing comedies during this period. And Afra Ben wrote one that's quite well known called The Rover. And it's a little different from the ones the men write and we'll see why and how. Uh, then we'll move in the uh, fifth session to Sheridan's School, The School for Scandal, which is sometimes thought to be probably, along with Congreve's The Way of the World, the best of this genre. Um, then we'll do, we'll finish up, if we don't run too far over time, or if I have to add a seventh session, um, Goldsmith, She Stoops to Conquer, which is thoroughly delightful in, a, in its own unique way. So I'm hoping that it will give you all a chance to read material you may not have read before, and that you have um, a lot of fun reading it and talking about it and we'll laugh, which we all need to do right now. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I, I never know how people can possibly decide on which courses to take here at Ollie. It seems like a, a huge challenge, um, which brings me to our next instructor, another legend. We basically have either legendary instructors here today, or we have new instructors who will be legendary soon. So Richard falls under the uh, legendary um, category. He, he's also the chair of our literature curriculum committee, um, and he um, organizes uh, incredible classes from a variety of instructors as well. He has a doctor in English with a specialization in Shakespeare and Greek mythology and worked for many years 
at um, the Albany Times Union, as well as the University of Albany. Um, and he is going to be teaching a class called The Good Nazi, Albert Speer, Hitler's Architect. This is going to be an online class on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. And I'll let him tell you all about it. Richard? Oh, thank you, Megan. Uh, if there ever was a man who sold his soul to the devil, it was Albert Speer. And he himself, during interviews in later years, likened himself to Faust, with Hitler playing the role of Mephistopheles. Though a high-ranking Nazi, Speer was quite unlike most of the thugs who were the party elite. Born into a wealthy, upper-middle-class family, he was intelligent, handsome, and hardworking. But at age 25, after receiving a degree in architecture from a prestigious university, he attended a Hitler rally and he was smitten. His architectural skills brought him into the Fuhrer's inner circle where he fulfilled Hitler's megalomaniac dreams by designing some of the most colossal structures ever conceived. Then appointed armaments minister during the war he accomplished what has been called the armaments miracle, actually producing more arms than there were armies to use them. After Germany's surrender, Speer was arrest arrested and indicted for war crimes. Standing before the International Tribunal at Nuremberg and facing possible execution by hanging, he made this remarkable statement. If Hitler had had any friends, I would certainly have been one of his close friends. Among the 23 top Nazis tried at Nuremberg, he was the only one who seemed penitent. He pronounced the trial fair and justified, which infuriated his fellow defendants. And he accepted full responsibility for all the crimes of the regime. The tribunal was impressed and gave him a 20 year sentence instead of the death penalty. Admirers called him the good Nazi. Skeptics contend it was merely a clever ploy to avoid the noose. In this course, we'll be considering Speer's life, his relationship with Hitler, and then after his release from prison, the inner conflict that drove him to both confess and conceal his own guilt for the remainder of his life. Over the six weeks, we'll also view the four hour 1982 film, Inside the, the Third Reich, based on his best selling memoir. And at the end of the presentation each week, there'll be time for participants to voice their own questions and opinions about this complicated and tortured man. Hope to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. You pick powerful subjects and uh, we are, um, we're grateful for that. Um, I now would like to introduce a soon to be a uh, legendary instructor, George Pinney, who this is, uh, I believe his first time teaching for Ollie. So he is, um, but he is already legendary. He's been nominated for a Tony Award. He's gotten an Emmy Award for Outstanding Choreography uh, for the PBS broadcast of the musical Blast. He is Professor Emeritus and former head of the um, Musical Theater Department um, at Indiana University. He's directed and choreographed for Broadway, the West End, regional theater, national and international tours. He's won many awards for being a fabulous teacher. We're so grateful to have him here. He's mm -hmm. gonna be teaching staging and choreography for musical theater in person. He did not wanna do this on Zoom, definitely not. Um, Thursdays at 11 a.m. at the Berkshire Museum, uh, beginning March 24th. George, take it away. 
Thank you so much. I, first of all, I'm very, very excited to be teaching for Ollie. Um, absolutely, my passion is musical theater, especially directing and choreography. So this course is going to break down into five sessions. The first one is going to be the kernel of truth. What ignites inspiration that takes us off the page onto the stage that can take us into design, conceptualization, choreography, staging. Um, and with this, I'll be showing a lot of archival video clips from rehearsals, different performances to support what we'll be talking about. Also, I'm going to talk about building on the shoulders of everyone. I mean, yes, there are the greats that have inspired my life, have inspired my work. But to tell you the truth, a beginning actor walking through the door can be an absolute source of inspiration. That inspiration is all around us and how we can tap into that. Then from there, the third uh, session will be on the new musical. Okay, the blank page, blank, white, the blank canvas. How do you jump off of it into an idea, into a script, into a score, and eventually up onto opening night? And then I will talk about Blast, the musical, the Broadway musical, um, which is an amazing story in itself. It could take all the sessions. In essence, um, it started with Star of Indiana, a drum and bugle corps uh, on there, and the artistic director had a vision of taking it to the stage. So from there, 140 people moved into arenas and performed. And from that, eventually I came into it. It was kind of like the liaison of taking it from off the football field, off the arena stage, and then onto the theatrical stage. And eventually Blast wound up um, on the Broadway stage and winning Best Theatrical Event Tony Award. And then our last session um, is interesting. With my students, I always tell them art, musical theater, theater, has the ability to change lives. And amazingly enough, after decades in education and the profession, I directed a musical several summers ago at the Utah Festival Opera and Musical Theater, and it changed my life, literally. And it's more like, yeah, yep, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And I'm really oh. looking forward to sharing that with you. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you. Wow, thank you so much, George. That sounds fantastic. Welcome to Ollie. We're so glad you're here. And there's somebody uh, joining us, uh, Dale Fink, also a retired professor. He's a transplanted Hoosier, so he wanted to send a shout out a special welcome to you. So we're, uh, we're absolutely delighted. Um, and uh, next up, I'm going to play the part of another beloved instructor named Ken Stark, because Ken's uh, water heater and his furnace both broke today and yes he is in the Berkshires not in Florida right now so he was not able to come and speak but he is teaching also in person and following uh, George Pinney's class um, so you can have a very musical fabulous Thursday in person at the Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield. Ken's class is Women Composers of Classical Music. It's at 1.30 p.m. Thursdays, beginning March 24th. And he'll talk about how com compositions, he, he emailed me what to say, how compositions of women composers are usually not played or incorporated into the symphonic repertoire unless there is a special reason, such as honoring a specific woman or events related to highlighting accomplishments of women. This really needs to change as when it comes to gender differences, no one can compare to Clara Schumann or Fanny Mendelssohn. Uh, so in his class, you'll explore the biographies and music of amazing women classical composers uh, beginning in the 11th century with Hildegard von Bingen until now. So Ken, people uh, always come out of his classes raving. And not only that, he provides snacks and CDs, I hear. Um, so that is a, a great class to look at as well. Next, we have a, we have the category of soon to be legendary. Uh, we have Don Barkin, who I believe is teaching for the first time for us. He is teaching a class called A Primer on Poetry. And um, it's, a, it's limited to just 15 people. So it's a nice 
uh, intimate interactive course. It's going to be held in person at the Stockbridge Library, and that is going to be Fridays at 11 a.m. beginning March 18th. And it is my uh, true delight to welcome uh, Don Barkin. Thanks. I am glad to be here, not at the exact moment. Um, I'm never glad to be on camera or looked at for that matter. But in principle, I'm glad to be here and I'll be delighted to start teaching in the Stockbridge Library. Um, my, I've been teaching in New Haven for a long time uh, at different colleges and uh, at Ollie's equivalent down here, which is the Institute for Learning and Retirement. Um, and uh, this course is one I've taught a few times. It's, I called it a primer for poetry. Primer is an old word, but I reckon that some of my contemporaries would remember that word. It's just beginning with poetry. The course is really open to anybody with no experience or a world of experience because my, my experience teaching it for a long time is that around a table reading the same poem, everybody will have something to add, something to contribute. At the end of each session, I usually end up telling the students that I had learned things in that class that I hadn't ever thought of before, just by listening. So it's that kind of class. If you're interested, the syllabus and the collection of poems we'll be reading are online at the uh, OLLI website where my class is listed. So if you wanna take a peek, you can do that. I also send out questions to get you thinking before each session, but most of the class is talking. Uh, I also am happy to have people write poems and if they're interested to share them with the class but it is, it's not really a, a writing class, it's a reading and talking class. What's interesting in the last week, I have a, a friend, a Ukrainian friend, who's been watching Ukrainian TV with me and translating. I'm gonna read a very short poem by the 20th century British American poet, W.H. Auden. He wrote it, it's called August, 1968, he wrote it, when the Soviet Union and uh, a few other Eastern Bloc countries invaded Czechoslovakia in order to put an end to the, uh, the Czech Spring, a, a liberalization in that country. And uh, they did so in short order with tanks. This poem called 19, uh, August 1968. The ogre does what ogres can, deeds quite impossible, for man. But one prize is beyond his reach. The ogre cannot master speech. About a subjugated plain, among its desperate and slain, the ogre stalks with hands on hips, while drivel gushes from his lips. It's a powerful poem. It, it seems as if it's a playground sticking out your tongue at somebody who's bigger than you are and is, and is threatening to stomp all over you. It may be that, but it's a good deal more than that. And I keep noticing in the last line, he says that the ogre stalks with hands on hips, which to people of our generations, will remind you of Mussolini, baby Hitler, the hands on hips pose of complete assurance. And that the drivel gushes from his lips. And when I kept saying the poem to myself while I was walking the dog today to memorize it, I, uh, I kept saying issues while drivel issues from his lips. Seems a small thing, not to a poet. To a poet, it's a big thing. Why drivel? Why does drivel gush from his lips? It gushes, I think, because he can't help it. A man like Putin or our last president may seem crafty. They speak of these men as 
crafty. Auden says, no, they're more like overflowing toilets that gush. Or somebody who's gut shot with a rifle, whose blood gushes, they aren't in control of speech. For Auden, the most human thing, the thing that's most human about us is our capacity for speech. To master speech is to become more and more of a human being. In this way, the poems we read will make us more human, more articulate, and more aware of what's going on beneath us, inside of us, and in the world. So I can't wait to start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you sure. so much, Don, and thank you for reminding us how important poetry is in the present day and how something written over 50 years ago can be so applicable. And we certainly just got a master class in that from you. It's really very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so uh, Don's class again is Fridays in person um, in Stockbridge and uh, it's limited to just 15 people. So I encourage you to sign up soon um, and you'll, 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 you will thank yourself, I am sure. Um, thank you, Don. Next up is Bob James. And Bob James, I would say at this point, to for me, he is the person that I know that knows the most about supply chains and transportation by far. I'd like to say he's like knows more than anyone in the world, but I can verify that because I don't know enough about it to, to know. He is teaching his third class for Ollie. And when we had him for the first time, I wasn't sure if people are going to sign up, the class was on supply chains. It was before the pandemic, so it was just about how supply chains work and you know how your Amazon box gets to you or all kinds of things. Tons of people signed up. Tons of everyone loved it, and so we've been encouraging Bob to teach again and again ever since because he is an unending source of really fascinating um, information and insight. Uh, so he recently did teach a class on how the pandemic and other things have disrupted supply chains. And now he's taking a bigger picture, looking further ahead. But he also is a long class name aficionado. His uh, course is called Exploring Disruption, a supply chain focus on trends and technologies affecting transportation and the rest of our lives. It's going to be online Fridays at 3 p.m. And um, he has, uh, he's also has a, a he's a, a lawyer served as a senior policy and planning aide for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the state of New Jersey. Um, he's the past president of the New York Transportation Research Forum, and uh, we're delighted to have him here today. Bob? Thank you very much. I guess the only segue I can make after John is to quote the Bee Gees. It's words, only words I have to give my love to you. So even though we're talking about a subject matter that is uh, relatively dry to most people, it is one that has uh, had a, a profound focus in my career. And some of the insights that I've drawn from that experience is that I've enjoyed sharing with an Ali, uh, with my Ali classes. Uh, now, we're talking about disruption. I mean, this is probably a bad time in our lives to talk about disruption because we know what it means uh, very painfully. Uh, you got to remember my last course was on COVID. Uh, freight frenzy and its interference with the supply chain. And now we see uh, the tremendous disruption that's taking place in our world events. But disruption and disruptive technologies aren't necessarily a bad thing nor a good thing, but they are things that, that make a difference in, in uh, the way things happen. They represent a break or an interruption in the normal course of business and the continuation of some activity and process. Uh, one professor, a shrewd uh, person by the name of Clayton Christensen, realized that there's a uh, business planning future in this term and, in, and came up in 1997 with the term disruptive technology to describe technologies that can have profound influence in our life. A disruption travels down a road that starts with uh, innovation, which is doing the same thing, uh, but maybe a little bit better. And then it moves uh, uh, to looking at things that are new ways of doing things, 
But finally, when we see a disruptive technology, we see one that makes old things obsolete. A famous uh, technological observer is a fellow by the name of Tony Seba, and I S E B A, and I recommend his materials to you. I will curate some of his insights into this, into this class. But he starts with a slide that shows the uh, Easter parade uh, in auto in in vehicles taking place in 1903, going down Fifth Avenue, and what we see is basically horses and carriage. And if you look very carefully, you'll see one car in the picture. He flashes 10 years forward and shows us the same vehicular Easter parade. And what we see are all automobiles. And if you look very carefully, you can see a horse in the area. Now there, the automobile certainly has been a disruptive technology and it grew uh, by a market of 81% in its first 10 years. And as we know, it's overwhelmed uh, our manufacturing. Those of us who are Ali uh, participants know what it's like to live through a life that's seen that same kind of uh, revolution take place in computing. And in fact, we now call it the digital technology. So if we're going to look at disruptors, then I'm going to do it. I have to turn to, to transportation models. Uh, and and I'm, some of them are freight models. Some of them are not. But uh, some of the things we will be looking at in the class are things like self-driving cars and trucks, drones and delivery bots. Uh, an organizing principle for, for these technologies is very important. So we'll look at ideas like, uh, like Uber for freight transportation, things that uh, uh, Tesla and, and particular Amazon have done in the area. There's the internet of things, big data uh, that are factors that have been identified, hybrid and electric vehicles, robotics, machine learnings, blockchain, Actually, we're going to try to limit these to maybe six topics of, of, of specific focus. And one of my favorites is 3D printing, which in its use can eliminate the in supply chain almost in its entirety. Important uh, concepts that will be explored are convergence. For example, how one idea comes with another, how computing can lead to, uh, for example, the digital revolution supports many of the other changes that have taken place. And we'll look at the new visions and business models uh, uh, that have inspired people uh, who, who have looked at the way the world is. For example, Uber's goal isn't simply to come up with a transportation hailing uh, uh, new way of, of getting a, a car to you efficiently. It really is to, to replace the automobile as something that we would own and something that we would share. And not only would that change the way transportation works, but it also would have major impacts on land use. Then we'll look at things like S-curves and uh, Gartner's development chart. And what these involve are how uh, changes and disruptions actually work their way into the economy and how they quicken uh, when they meet consumer demand and they lower costs in a radical way and how many of the disruptors we see today are moving forward. But on the chastening side, we'll look at uh, uh, what the Gartner uh, another uh, consulting firm in the technology area shows that these things get a lot of hype at the beginning, then they, they sink down into interest and people seem not to look at them and they spring up again, like uh, coming out of the uh, Phoenix, coming out of the ashes uh, to, to new and effective ideas. Uh, the other point I'd like to stride is we're not just talking about business change here. Some of these technologies are actually existentially important to us. And I think of that mostly as the substitute for non-fossil fuels, which will figure so much into the development of transportation vehicles into the future. Uh, with this transition and with the mobility devices that it will help produce, we should have a lot to do about decarbonizing our universe, which I think is an existential threat to us. And a lot of these factors will play their way out. 3D printing will change the world because it'll be the combination of the material and the last point of production, which eliminates a lot of sidesteps. And again, the material, the ability to have the stuff that can be 3D printed may change our whole geopolitical world. I see a rise in Africa with all its uh, um, raw materials uh, as a factor in changing the equation in our lives. And anyway, I hope this will be a contemplative course. So one where we can bring in some outside experts one that would probably challenge your imagination 
and you would act like question, you know, is, is that my next uh, electronic gizmo going to show up on my doorstep by a drone? I mean, that could be very important to our lives. But in any case, uh, I think there's a lot of questions uh, that you can ask in this course about where things are going. I hope that we can answer them together and bring in some people on the outside. We will do that in, in, in six sessions, easy to listen to sessions and participate in, I hope. And that's what I have to offer this semester. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. That sounds wonderful. And you've already, you know, gave us so much information and things to think about in this, you know, just in the past few minutes. We're so grateful that you'll be teaching this. So again, that class is online. It's on uh, Friday afternoons at 3 p.m. Um, Eastern. Thank you, Bob. And next, I'd like to introduce Naomi Spatz. Um, let me just bring her right up here. Naomi is a force of nature. What can I say? Um, she and Barbara Waldinger are, are two of the leaders of the Performing Arts Initiative at OLLI. And um, she has been uh, co-leading this annual class for several years. It's the Berkshire Performing Arts Previews. Um, and it will be held online again this year on Tuesdays, beginning March 22nd at 1130 AM. And uh, what we'll get is just uh, extraordinary uh, conversations and a peek behind the scenes from uh, all of the best uh, performing arts organizations in the region. She, Naomi has uh, brought them all together um, just for us. So Naomi, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. Um, this is sort of a, a bittersweet uh, talk because I have done this course for years, uh, but I did it together with my colleague and friend, Nancy Vale, who had the, who died two years ago with some freak accident at the hospital. Um, and this has been a bittersweet week because we also found out that Nancy had generously left Ollie a, a, a six, uh, six digit donation of $187,000 to support the performing arts. So we miss her terribly, but um, we were also shocked when she died to learn that she was just a, a few months shy of 90 because she was like the energizer bunny. Um, but Barbara Waldinger, who is also one of the founders of our performing arts initiative, uh, has kindly agreed to step in because we like to have two moderators. We will be having, uh, the classes will run for six weeks, uh, which is longer than we have, but in the past, we usually limited to five. But now with the virus, we're keeping our fingers crossed that all the performing arts that we're hoping for will be able to be in person. And uh, it's a very creative lot of people that uh, we have. So um, the first, class will be on um, March 22nd. And it's one of my favorites because it's a panel of critics and they will be talking about what they're looking forward to this season and also um, anything that they've been doing over the last two years because we have been, we've been in trouble for the last two years. So on March 22nd, we, uh, at 1130, there will be five critics who will be discussing their dreams. And that's Peter Bergman, Jeff Borak, Dan Dwyer, Macy Levin, and Barbara Waldinger, who has many hats, and one of them is a critic. Um, for the next five weeks, we will have two artistic directors on uh, each, each Tuesday, and they will talk for 30 minutes. Uh, each one will talk 30 minutes, open up for a Q&A for another 10 minutes, we'll take a five minute break. And the next, the second artistic director will come on. Um, so have your questions ready. We will have opportunity to do it. And on March 29th, um, Kate McGuire will be presenting the case for the uh, Berkshire Theatre Group. Um, and she will be followed by Pam Tadjay of Jacob's Pillow, who has had quite a season or two. She had a theater burned down and she's been doing some amazing work online and in, in education. And the following week we'll have uh, Wham, the artistic director, uh, Kirsten van Ginhoven, and followed by our, our dear Alan Burroughs of Shakespeare and Company. Uh, Shakespeare has announced part of their season and hoping to do more um, 
he had a particular interesting take on what to do with the virus. He built himself a Greek theater so people could watch plays out, uh, out outside and sit away from each other. Um, each one of them had a very interesting take on what to do during the virus. Um, Chester set up a tent or used a tent at uh, Shaker Village. Um, also, Barrington Stage set up under a tent. Uh, Williamstown set up around the pool at Clark. Uh, they, uh, Kate from Berkshire Theatre was setting up tables and chairs outside to do cabarets and everything else. Um, they were quite amazing. And Kate and, uh, and Julian Boyd of Barrington Stage had announced in this course two years ago that they were negotiating with Actors' Equity about putting on shows during the virus. And then it was announced that yes, they had a, a, come to an agreement with Actors' Equity. And the strange thing was they were the only two theaters in the country. It was, I thought they were part of a whole group that was negotiating with Actors' Equity, the safest, the best way to do it. No, it was just these two amazing women. Um, more and then in it's- More innovation from the Berkshires. Oh, yeah, I was listening to everyone. That there's innovations or there's things that were, or someone said that he really wasn't uh, teaching, but he was putting together something. So I put things together. And then we, we so we have Alan Burris. Then the next week on April 12th, um, Berkshire Opera will be presenting their season. They have done some amazing work here. And we're happy to have Jonathan Loy, who's coming to talk because he is one of the co-founders and he also directs at the Met. And he's just charming. Um, and then uh, the second part of that day on April 12th, uh, two divine men who run the Br Bridge Theater will be coming. Um, and we look forward to hearing what they're going to be doing in their season. Some seasons are set, some are open. And uh, um, I say no one is sort of gathering as sardines to read reviews. They're all looking at uh, how the virus, how rich the virus is here and whether it's going down and you can take masks off and everything else. And then we go on to um, uh, April 19th, another strange thing. We've had a lot of resignations and things and we usually have from Williamstown Theater, uh, Laura Savia, and she emailed me last week to say she's moving to Chautauqua. So this is the third of the artistic directors who announced they're leaving this year, uh, that Barrington Stage and Williamstown. Um, and then this will be a first time participant is the following week. Um, Jim Frangione, who's done a lot of theater work up here uh, and new playwrights, old playwrights, readings and things. Uh, he's now doing, uh, running the, I guess, founded at the Great Barrington Public Theater. And we're all looking forward to hearing what his season will be this year. And for the final, um, April 26th, uh, we will have Chester Theater Company with the producing artistic director, Daniel Elahal Kramer, who will be, who just announced last week what his season is. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that no plague intervenes. And for the finale, uh, that wonderful woman, Julian Boyd, who's run Barrington stage for years. Uh, it was a shock uh, that she announced her resignation to retirement. We thought that she would be carried out for the last of the sets from her final show. And as many of you know and have attended it, that some of her shows have gone on to Broadway and done fairly well. So we're very excited. Also, I'd like to say that all the artistic directors are very, very happy to come to Ali and to talk at Ali because it's their audience. They love it. When I email them to invite them, they usually respond within 12 hours. They're an amazing group. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, no homework and um, uh, just keep your fingers crossed that the virus cooperates and thank you very much. By the way, you will see under my name, Stephen Somkin, my husband who is sitting here, we use my computer uh, for audio. <laughs> so he also will talk about his class, uh, which is also theater, but it's older. <laughs> As in Greek theater. Thank, thank you very you. much, Megan. And you, Megan, you're also leaving us. I mean, how, how, how sad that question. is. Uh, well, we're not going to talk about that today, but thank you, Naomi. Um, that is such a fabulous way to get a sense of the upcoming summer in the Berkshires and what the what the thinking is behind the 
seasons and what the artistic directors are programming and why, and you get to ask them questions. It's absolutely wonderful. And I have no doubt that when they see that email from Naomi Spatz, they know that they need to reply. And we're so grateful that they do. And Naomi does a fabulous job organizing it um, uh, along with Barbara Waldinger. So we're so grateful. Uh, next up, I'm delighted to welcome Barry Gann. This will be the second time that he's teaching for Ollie. He and his wife taught a class on China a couple of seasons ago, um, but this time he's teaching a class called Toward a Philosophy and Nonviolence, and this has really been uh, the passion of his life, I think. Um, he taught at St. Bonaventure University for 36 years, um, and for 26 of those years he edited the F Acorn, Journal of the Gandhi King Society, um, and he has also served as the program chair of the oldest and largest interfaith peace group in the United States, the Fellowship, Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, this is another uh, small class. It is going to be online, but it's limited to 35 people, so you have a chance for a thoughtful discussion and interaction. And uh, the class is offered Wednesday mornings at 9.30 a.m. And Barry is here to tell us more about it. Barry? Megan, thank you for the introduction. I'm getting an echo when I use these headphones, so I'm taking them off. Um, yes, I've limited the class to 35 because I intend that the class will be uh, discussion in large part. We're going to be using a short uh, text that I wrote uh, maybe 10 years or so ago uh, on violence and nonviolence. I've been studying uh, conflict uh, since eighth grade, maybe, when I gave a presentation on the Strategic Air Command and how that was keeping the United States safe and so forth. Um, but over the years, especially during the Vietnam years, uh, I became a pacifist and began uh, to look at different uh, manifestations of nonviolence as ways of addressing conflict. Uh, with the uh, arrival of the Gandhi film in 1982, I became much more interested in nonviolence and not just pacifism, but nonviolence in one's life as a way of addressing conflict. Uh, and then uh, uh, with the rise of uh, the new millennium 2000, and especially uh, 10 or 11 years later, the Arab Spring, there was a lot of attention paid to what is called civil resistance or nonviolent political action as a means of addressing conflict. I've become disenamored of that uh, to a very large extent. And so what the course will do over uh, six sessions is look first at various myths that uh, I think exist regarding the nature of violence and what violence is and what it isn't. And we'll spend the first two classes uh, talking about that and using uh, a couple of chapters in my book as jumping off points for those discussions. Uh, after that, we'll turn to look at uh, uh, what is called civil resistance and what a lot of people call nonviolent political action and examine the extent to which it really is or isn't uh, nonviolent. Uh, and in the uh, following session, we'll look at um, the limits of that kind of civil resistance and, and why civil resistance often fails, as I think it did in the case of Egypt and certainly in the case of Syria. We'll then turn to look at uh, the roots of nonviolence in six major religious traditions, uh, Buddhism, uh, Islam, the Abrahamic religions, uh, Islam, uh, Christianity, Judaism, uh, they say Hinduism uh, and Jainism. Uh, we'll also look at some secular roots of nonviolence as in uh, Plato and uh, oh, Henry David Thoreau, who many people think of as being nonviolent because of his essay on civil disobedience, but he was actually quite supportive of John Brown's violent insurrection uh, against slavery. And then uh, finally, we'll look at uh, what I call comprehensive nonviolence. I've become more and more convinced as I've aged that the way to address conflict really has to begin uh, in one's own heart and in the example one sets for others. And my teaching uh, in high schools, junior high schools and colleges over the years has convinced me that uh, what students learn has far less to do with the material one presents and far more to do with the uh, model one presents and the example one offers others. So, that's kind of a sur uh, purview of the course. Thank you, Megan.
Thank you so much, Barry. Um, it's a powerful subject and certainly one that's extremely uh, relevant right now. And uh, well, I should add, if you don't mind, Megan, I'm yeah. sure we'll be talking about Ukraine. Sure, so. absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're, we now go back to the Naomi and Stephen Somkin residents. Uh, they are a husband and a wife instructor this semester, which is fabulous. Um, and now we're talking to Steve Somkin. He is teaching a class on Aeschylus. And I had to double check the, the pronunciation of that because I'm not very good at those things. Um, Stephen, after a career in medicine, he returned to his two real loves playwriting in ancient Greeks, as well as Naomi. And um, he is, uh, so he writes plays, he's taught a number of classes about the ancient Greeks for us, but he also taught a class on dinosaurs recently. And there's a lot of new information about dinosaurs. So maybe he'll do that again, but but this, this semester it's gonna be Aeschylus and he's here to tell us more about it. Stephen. Thank you, Megan. Uh, hopefully Aeschylus is not considered among the dinosaurs. <laughs> Aeschylus um, uh, was born in the 6th century BC, and he's considered the father of tragedy, and he's the first of the three great Greek tragedi tragedians. The uh, course is, is uh, six weeks. It's going to start with a general introduction of the Greek world and the Greek mythology and the religion of the Greek world which is very important in the plays, uh, particularly of Aeschylus, but all three of the, well, really all of the uh, playwrights in that area. Um, the, the first introductory will be, uh, as I say, general about the religious background, the origin of plays, which came out of dance, and um, the nature of the Greek theater, and uh, how it was presented and how it was staged. Uh, Aeschylus is particularly known uh, for having introduced the second actor into, into drama. And this was, believe it or not, this was a major innovation. Um, previously, it was just the chorus and dancers and a single actor who would tell the story with two actors drama conflict became possible. So after that introduction, um, we're going to look at five of the Aeschylus extant plays. Uh, Seven Against Thebes, which is uh, picking up on the Oedipus story. Uh, the, um, uh, the Suppliant Women, which is a story of the daughters of Danaeus who were forced to marry their cousins, there are 50 of, 50 of each, uh, and this was not a happy marriage, shall we say. Uh, the, the only one extant play uh, has actually a happy ending, which is rather unusual. Um, the, the third, fourth and fifth plays are part of the Oresteia, that is the, the story of Orestes uh, from, the Ag from the murder of Agamemnon to the uh, libation bear bearers, which is the story of Electra and the murder of the murderers of Agamemnon, Clytemnestra and Aegisthes. And the, the final play is the uh, Eumenides, which is the, the transformation from the Furies to the Eumenides and the guardian spirits of a, a peaceful Athens. Uh, the way the course will be structured is we will, uh, we will read out loud selected sections of the plays to get a feel for the language, and the drama that encompasses. Uh, and then we'll discuss, and the, mainly the, the main topic of discussion will be the contemporary resonance 
of these ancient themes. So I hope uh, you will join us. It is a limited course. It'll be 15 uh, students in each course. We will do it uh, at the Berkshire Library. Yeah. The, uh, sorry, in Stockton's Stockton. Library. Uh, and uh, I welcome any and all to this course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And that's going to be on Friday afternoons at 1.30 p.m. And uh, it is, um, as he said, limited to just 15 people now. We only have three instructors left um, and uh, for those keeping track. And the next one is actually going to talk via phone and um, Ray is going to show slides. So we haven't done this before, but, you know, be patient with us and hopefully it will all work, right? Hopefully she's there. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get her to unmute, but I think it's not working. Okay, well, let's uh, skip her and we'll, we can come back if, um, if it works and if it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, but that is Barbara Turner Hart and it's a class on collage, uh, which should be wonderful. Um, next up, uh, I am always delighted to bring forward Hank Gold. Hank is a retired, wait, I always get it wrong. Radiologist? I got it right. Okay, sorry. I know I should look at my notes, but but sometimes I forget. Uh, but most importantly, he is a keen uh, wildlife observer in his backyard. Um, he has all kinds of visitors, birds and all kinds of critters. And he is also one of our terrific moderators of our science conversations class, which we used to offer twice a year, but we now offer five times a year, every semester we have the class because science keeps going and there's always more and more interesting discoveries. That class is gonna be held online on Fridays at 1 p.m. And I will turn over the invisible microphone so Hank can tell you more about it. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, yeah, uh, this class, uh, you know, I'm just blown away by the descriptions that people uh, have given for the classes that they're going to be teaching. Uh, and and I can't do that because we have no set uh, uh, syllabus. We use the um, Tuesday New York Times science section as the basis of our discussion. And I don't teach it. Uh, everyone who attends participates. Uh, that's what makes this class so so good is the people who are there attending my class uh, are the ones who talk. The less I talk, the better off it is, uh, as you can probably realize now. Uh, I'm just the moderator, I'm not the teacher. I'm a retired radiologist, and I do have a special interest in space exploration. The James Webb Telescope is gonna be coming online uh, shortly, and, and I'm sure that I'll be talking uh, about the various things that are, are um, involved in, in making it a special uh, observatory. Uh, and I look forward to the participation of, of the people who uh, signed up for this class. Um, you know who you are, who've uh, done it before. And, and I hope we get more people because it's always a stimulating conversation. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you so much, Hank. Um, uh, uh, Science Conversations is one of two moderated discussion classes. The other one is today's headlines, which is also terrific. Um, and that moderator is not here to join us today. Um, but that, of course, with, between science and current events, there's never a lack of things to talk about. And then I think for our final um, instructor, we um, actually, Christ we have Christine Casey. She wasn't able to be here because I believe she's in Hawaii, uh, lucky lady, um, but she did send a very short recording talking about her class and here it comes. Hello everyone. My name is Christine Casey and it is my pleasure to present an introduction to six great operas, part two for the spring Ali semester. I'll be doing this online on Thursday afternoons between 4 and 5.30 p.m. As a retired music teacher and a singer for most of my life and a lifelong opera lover, I've always been fascinated about these operas, how they came to be 
and what was some of the earliest production history. So I plan to tell you all about those things. Uh, I'll be starting with Rigoletto by Verdi. The next week I'll do Madama Butterfly by Puccini, followed by The Magic Flute by Mozart. Then I'll do Eugene Onegin by Tchaikovsky, Manon by Massenet, and I will finish with Die Meistersinger von Nürnberg by Wagner. In each session, I plan to provide information on the composer and information on the librettist, how they came to write this piece, and maybe some early production history, including uh, at what time the United States first saw this production. I do this through a slideshow uh, that has scenes of uh, recent productions, and I include musical excerpts from a recording that I prefer on that, on that particular opera. I will also provide English translation for everything that you will be hearing because all of these um, operas will be done in a foreign language. I think it's a great opportunity to learn a little bit about opera, um, this, but this can be for everyone, for those who know and love opera to those who are introduced to it and merely curious. I hope to see you on Thursday afternoons for my class from 4 till 5.30 p.m. Once again, this is Chris Casey. Hope to see you there. Bye. So there you have it. Those are some of our um, spring instructors uh, coming up. Um, the semester starts March 18th. Uh, we encourage you to register if you haven't yet. If you have already registered for one or more classes, but would like to add one, we totally understand. Uh, you, you do need to call or email the OLLI office and we'll be happy to set that up for you. Um, and if you're not yet an OLLI member, you can find out information about joining on our website as well as by calling, you can join either way. And that allows you to sign up for classes. And I also want to let everyone know that we also offer a scholarship level. So if finances are a challenge, please get in contact with us and we can give you all the information. We want um, the, the benefits of Ollie and learning and, and gathering together uh, to reach as many people as possible. So finally, if you have any questions for any of the instructors, um, we're happy to have them answer them now if they're still here um, or any questions about Ollie. Otherwise, we will see you again soon in class, either in person or online. And I, as someone did ask earlier if hybrid meant what hybrid meant. And so the two classes that are hybrid, that means that they're offered in person, but they're also taped this so you can watch them live on Zoom. So there you can do either in person or online, it's it's your choice and you can actually go back and forth if you want. And those two classes are the Innovation in the Berkshires, which will be held at the Berkshire Innovation Center in Pittsfield, and the Breaking the Common Pot with Kate Kidd, um, and that's my cat's tail, um, which will be held at BCC and in person. So seeing no questions, I just want to thank all of our instructors and Barbara Lane and Ray Langsdale um, and all of our volunteers for making Ollie uh, the wonderful organization it is. And uh, we will see you all soon. Thanks again.